Okay. <clears throat> Hey guys, Marissa here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be sharing with you all of the books that I have read so far in 2020. Now I know that sounds big and exciting and like woo, but don't be too impressed it's only four books. I think I had mentioned in my last video that I still had some like pre-filmed footage that I was hanging on to that I was probably going to edit and put up, but realistically I went back and you know, started pulling through it to edit and just wasn't feeling it. So I'm going to refilm this. We're going to do like mini reviews for all four books shocking that I have read so far this year. Um, though I guess it's not horrible. It's like one book a month-ish, though I totally took March off and just read two books this month. Anyways, let's get going. So the first book that I read this year was Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones by James Clear. And I listened to this on audio, which was published or put out in the world by Random House Audiobooks. Now this is kind of exactly what it sounds like on the tin. It's a book talking about habit formation, habit systems, and how to kind of like automate more of the processes in your life to basically make yourself more efficient and effective in all aspects of your life. The first thing that I really like about this book is that it feels very well researched and um, very well put together. Um, you can really tell that this is a subject that James Clear has spent a lot of time researching and um, reading up on and he definitely references several um, other kind of habit or productivity experts so that you don't feel like you have to rely on his expertise alone, which I always appreciate. I also really like that the book is very actionable in that it breaks down the whole process of habit formation into very clear, um, easy, small steps or increments that you can achieve. And I think that really jives with his overall message of focus on the process of forming a habit and not the ultimate end goal of what you want that habit to achieve, if that makes sense. In in that sense, this book is very successful and um, it, it does it does offer a very approachable approach that was redundant. It, it feels very achievable. Now I will say that I don't know if this was the best book to read as an audiobook because as I said, it's very action oriented and at the end of each chapter, he literally gives you like a little checklist or a, a outline or summary sheet. Um, so I think if you actually had the physical book, that might be helpful so that you could visually see how he had laid that out. Um, obviously, I did not have the physical book, so I was kind of trying to chart in my head and I actually did take a few notes and like do a little bit of charting for myself just so it was a little bit easier to follow. However, something that irritated me to no end um, and I think would would have been the same if I had been reading the physical book as well is the fact that he references his website like at least 15 times a chapter. Maybe that's a slight exaggeration, but he, he references his website way too much. Basically, James Clear has a habit formation website, which obviously was the precursor to the book deal. So is it surprising that there's overlap in content? No. Do I appreciate spending money on a book and then being told to go to his website where I have to sign up for a newsletter so that I can download a downloadable or get even more information? No, the book should be the more information. Um, I don't know. If, if you can tell, this really irritated me and I just don't, I feel like you're cheating your readers when you want them to spend money on a book and then you're not giving them, then you want them to go somewhere else where you can advertise to them and ugh, whatever. So did not enjoy that. And if I'm completely honest, that alone would put me off recommending this book to you guys, no matter how good his habit formation processes are. All right, wow, I just got really salty. So let's move on to the next book. This next one will calm me down immediately because this was my favorite book of the year so far. And that is All Creatures Great and Small by James Harriet. Now, James Harriet is actually a, a what do you call it? A, a, not a pseudonym, a um, pen name for an actual person who was uh, James Allred White. I don't know why that is so hard to say. James Allred White, uh, who was a countryside veterinarian in uh, in the UK, who apparently is quite beloved and I had just never heard of before. All Creatures Great and Small is a compilation of uh, James Harriet's first two memoirs, um, talking about his time when he basically had just graduated from veterinary school and had just moved um, into his apprentice stage, I guess, where he, he went and joined an existing veterinary practice and learned from both the owner and just from going out and visiting clients, um, mainly on farms 
and uh, a few small animals in farming homes. This is the first book in what I believe is a series of four memoir compilation books. I think each of the audiobooks is two of his written memoirs, I think. Don't quote me on that. Um, and this first one is set in the 1930s. So it does talk a bit about the effects of the Great War on um, the British countryside. Um, it talks a bit uh, about uh, technology at the time. And I found it really fascinating to think that um, like they were, they were still developing modern um, medical procedures for humans. So to read about um, the veterinary practices at the time was really, really interesting. I also thoroughly enjoyed the ruminations on his very crappy little car that was going through petrol like no other, that like you could go over a bump and you'd, you know, like literally spring a hole in the floor or, you know, going out to these countryside barns and realizing that, oh no, they don't have running water out here yet or electricity and um, it's freezing and he has to like strip down and, you know, get half inside a cow to, to caver. And um, it was just very interesting, especially if you need something wholesome and soothing right now, I would highly suggest checking out James Harriet. Um, this series, I've, I'm in the middle of book two right now. This series has basically felt like a nice warm cup of tea, like a, like a blanket at the end of the day. It's just, it's very calming. And I genuinely feel when I read this that I'm like insulated from all the evils of actual life. So um, if that's not a ringing endorsement for this book, I don't know what is. And if you can, I would highly, highly recommend this as an audiobook reading experience, simply because the narrator is fantastic. This entire um, series of audiobooks is narrated by Christopher Timothy, who basically in this narration gives a masterclass on how to do a variety of British accents. Number one, he just has a very pleasing voice. So the already pleasing descriptions of British countryside are made even better by his normal voice. But then the crazy ability he has to differentiate between a lot of different characters simply based on tone of voice and convey a lot in that accent, whether it's class, whether it's um, level of of anxiety or energy or, you know, the weather. He just, it's, it's literally like listening to a masterclass narration. So I would highly recommend not only James Harriet uh, as just a general um, reading experience, but if you can get your hands on an audiobook version of this, it's pure gold. Going back through this list, I feel like my reading so far has been incredibly schizophrenic because the topics are all over the place. Next up, we have another audiobook, which is uh, Yes, We Still Can, Politics in the Age of Obama, Twitter, and Trump by Dan Pfeiffer, release, released by Hatchet Audiobook group. Like I said, a bit of a departure from James Harriet. Now, if you are not already a Crooked Media or Podsave fan, Dan Pfeiffer was an Obama staffer during both of his terms in the White House. He uh, initially worked on Obama's campaign and then worked his way up to um, communications staffer and then, or assistant, assistant, deputy, com deputy communications director, and then a uh, in his like final role in the White House was a special assistant to the president, um, which I'm still not entirely sure what that means, but that's I think what his job title was. Yes, We Still Can is Dan's uh, memoir of his political career starting from the time he was like in high school, going all the way up through his Obama years, um, ending around, I'm not sure if it was right after the inauguration of Trump or just like in that first year or so, I believe that's when he was writing the book. Um, and it is, I think, a really interesting look at at a political career, basically from beginning to end. I mean, I know he's still an activist and he's still um, active in politics. I guess he he's become a pundit, as you might say, but he is no longer an active political operator. There we go. That's what I meant. You guys probably already know this, but I'm a huge fan of the Crooked Media uh, universe of podcasts. As a fan of the podcast, I've always felt like I have known the least about Dan. He typically keeps it pretty non-personal. Um, he, he likes to focus on policy um, and he, I feel, has always given while the others tend to get a little bro from time to time, he's always been very focused on like providing clear analysis of current political events. And 
I really appreciated getting to know him better through this memoir. Another thing I really liked about the memoir was that it doesn't have like that like West Wing effect and by that I mean you know in the West Wing when um, the staffers are all beaten down and then someone will come in and give a rousing um, a motivational speech and like everything will suddenly be better. Uh, this book does not suffer from that. Um, yes, Dan does talk about different inspirational moments and like crazy things that he got to be a part of, but he's really honest about like the brutal day-to-day -day life um, as a staffer in the White House. He's not also afraid to admit where they were wrong, where he personally was wrong and where like they completely screwed up. And you know, he's pretty clear sometimes that if I could go back, I would do this differently. And I think that shows a lot of of self-awareness and I think it's appreciative or or I was appreciative for that that hindsight because I think a lot of us right now especially are like we look fondly back at the Obama years and we're like oh re remember that time and I think Dan does a really good job of somehow still being relatively objective while obviously still being an Obama bro so I, I don't know how he does it but um, I quite appreciated that he was not afraid to look back on his experiences and say, no, we really, really could have done that differently and maybe we even caused some of what's going on right now. Speaking of, the title kind of suggests that um, he's giving a bit of a playbook for um, democratic politicians of today. And I will say that while he does have several, like, here's a lesson, children moments, um, it's not overtly that. I would say that the memoir kind of overpowers the lessons a bit but that being said I do think that he um, makes several really good points um, drawing from his own experiences again about how the Democratic Party has failed in certain aspects about how we need to adapt faster how we need to look at our relationship with the media and how we really do need to focus more on like political storytelling going forward and uh, several other lessons that I just think were were quite um, insightful and uh, very, very well, like it didn't feel like he was bashing you over the head with them. So overall, I enjoyed this political memoir. Um, I think possibly more than Ben Rhodes was um, another Obama staffer whose memoir I read, also part of, part of the Crooked Media crew. Um, and I think I might have enjoyed this one more. Overall, if you want to pick one Obama staffer book, as of the ones I have read so far, I would suggest this one because again, he does tend to have that very objective um, hindsight, which I think is helpful. Okay, and then shockingly, I have a physical book here, uh, which is actually, <laughs> guys, it's so short. It's a chat book, okay? Don't judge me. This is Families Among Us by Blake Kimsey. This is a chat book short story collection, um, and it is published by Black Lawrence Press, which is a fantastic indie press, by the way, if you want to shop small and support um, small uh, presses right now this might be one to check out. Now, I first heard about this on Jen Campbell's channel and actually received this for free, I think, I think I received this for free from the publisher back when I first purchased, I purchased, we're just pulling random books in now. We are going free form. Rules have no more meaning. I purchased um, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone by Sequoia Nagamatsu couple of years ago now and really enjoyed this and then when the publisher realized that I like had a platform they offered to send me this which was cool um so okay we'll put that back later this is like I said a short story chapbook collection the stories are quite short um I think the shortest one is like not even what is that a page page and a quarter. The longest one in here I think was actually my favorite story of the bunch um, and that was The Skylight which is um, about an American living in Paris um, who likes to go up to the um, roof of his building and feed owls and then one day he has a strange encounter with a woman who lives in his building and dresses in a full um burqa and uh kind of how that relationship um entwines when they both meet again on the roof this collection is definitely for fans of jen campbell um if you are interested in that kind of like eerie fairy tale-esque um 
quality to her writing. I think you would really enjoy this. He deals a lot with transformations. He deals a lot with otherness, um, with um, otherness within one family and a lot with like parent child relationships, which I thought was interesting. I will say that although the topics and themes of the writing are again similar to Jen Campbell. I don't want you guys going into this thinking that you're going to get that same lyrical quality to the writing. I think he has, de I mean, it's definitely like literary fiction, but he lacks some of that like lyrical poetic, po poeticism, poeticness um, to his, I, I mean, who am I to judge? Obviously. Basically, Jen is a poet um originally right and i think that really comes across in her fiction i think it comes across that he is not originally a poet um while it is very good writing it's just not i i just because i'm comparing him to jen i don't want you guys going into this thinking it's going to be that exact quality of writing i did not dislike the writing i just wanted to point that out point out the difference maybe i shouldn't even brought up the comparison whatever we're moving on the one thing i will say that i really did not like about this collection though and that i did not really realize until two or three stories from the end is that they are all incredibly similar um when i say that he deals with transformation a lot i mean a lot like every single story has a transformation element to it um and unfortunately it kind of became maybe i should have spaced out the stories a bit more when i was reading it but it, it kind of became this weird like okay he, he indicated something's transforming can i guess what creature it's transforming into um game uh because i mean they all follow the same formula essentially so that was kind of unfortunate i guess on one hand you could say that thematically they all um you know tie themselves together quite nicely but realistically in my opinion the best um the best short story collections have an underlying theme but they don't they don't feature stories that all follow the same formula if you want to read this because again i think it's it's kind of eerie and fun and 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 I do like the stories individually I would say just space out the reading a bit more than I did I read this in just two sittings um so that you don't get that same repetitive quality um so yeah a little bit of an unfortunate end to my reading experience but overall individually I really enjoyed each story particularly the skylight so that was a rambly way of saying I would still check it out just change maybe how you read this one. All right, that is it. Those are all the books that I have read in 2020. And if you have read any of these or are interested in any of these now that I have rambled about them, hopefully somewhat coherently, uh, feel free to leave me a comment down below. Also, if you have any books that you think I would enjoy based on what I have read and discussed here, feel free to recommend that as well. Um, but otherwise, I'm gonna wrap things up here, trying to keep this video kinda tight and, you know, shorter than usual because lord knows i can ramble for a long time if i want to like i said i am going back and like refilming things i had filmed back in march that i'm just not super happy with anymore so um hopefully more videos coming at you soon um pray for my laptop y'all because the fans been going crazy every time i every time i try and edit all right officially getting myself off thank you guys so much for watching i hope everyone is getting to spend a little bit more time enjoying stories in any form right now i hope you guys are all doing well and i hopefully will see you in the next one okay bye